black holes aren't what you think they are. They're not holes, they're not black, and we can actually see them. And we've even managed to take a picture of one. You are currently looking at something incredible. The first ever image of a black hole, the one at the center of the Messier 87 galaxy, 55 million light years away. Now we know there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, which is 27,000 light years from the solar system. And we know that it's super massive because in 2008, Professor Andrea Getz and her team measured how big it was and found that it was 4 million times more massive than the sun. This measurement was such a big deal that in 2020, she won the Nobel Prize in Physics. To work this out, they studied the orbits of the stars moving at incredible speeds around the black hole and used this to weigh the black hole. If there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy, that's gonna force these objects that are really close to the black hole to move much faster than they would move if there were no black hole. So the first thing you wanna see is that there are very fast moving objects where you think the black hole is. If there's a black hole, there's a further prediction you can make about what these stars are gonna, are gonna do. They are gonna move around the black hole on very short periods. In other words, you're gonna be able to see them move on more than just straight lines as part of their, um, their travel around the black hole. These stars are gonna move around the black hole because of the gravity, just like planets move around the sun. Contrary to their name and to common belief, not all black holes are black. In fact, the gas and dust that spirals around the black hole can be accelerated to huge speeds, which heats up due to friction, causing it to glow. In fact, feeding black holes are some of the brightest objects in the entire universe. There's a supermassive black hole in the center of every galaxy. So how do we know? When quasars were first discovered, they were thought to be hugely bright stars and any ideas of them being black holes were dismissed as just crazy. But we now know they are feeding black holes. And they're described as feeding because stars and gas clouds that get too close are torn apart violently by the immense gravity and then lost beyond the event horizon to become part of the black hole. They're essentially like a little snack for the black hole. There's a quasar at the center of the Cygnus A galaxy that's a trillion times brighter than our sun. And Dr. Andy Fabian from the University of Cambridge is studying this quasar with X-ray images. These help reveal the gas clouds that are orbiting around the black hole. There's a lot of other things going on out there and enormous amounts of energy being released, which we can only be aware of if we look with X-ray eyes we could see what was going on at the centre and we could start to understand how the black hole was feeding energy out into all the surrounding gas. The friction generated by this dense atmosphere of gases produces the hottest and most electrically charged environment in the universe. What we know is that the hotter something gets, the brighter it gets, the more light it emits. By feeding on all this gas, the black holes sometimes end up with just too much material around them and end up burping out a load of it, which then impacts the galaxy. This can actually expel a load of the gas that the galaxy would have used to make more stars, and essentially stopping the galaxy from growing any bigger. So black holes seem to wield a worrying amount of power. They can literally control how big a galaxy can grow. Galaxies could, in a way, be much bigger than they currently are. Something is stopping them growing larger. And that something is the black hole at the center. Now, this is bizarre because the ratio of the size of the black hole to the size of the galaxy is the same as the ratio between a grape, or something this big, and the size of the Earth. It sounds impossible that something that small would have so much control over something that big, but that is what's going on. It's been calculated that the mass of a black hole is on average about 0.5% of the mass of a galaxy. Essentially, the bigger the galaxy, the bigger the black hole will be. This correlation made astronomers start to wonder whether black holes might have been present or even responsible for the birth of their galaxy. Because it really meant that there was something linking these tiny 
supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies with the whole galaxy itself. It meant that somehow their whole history had been intertwined, that the growth of the galaxies and the growth of the black holes was somehow related. Now in the early universe, we don't know if stars formed first or if black holes formed first. But if the black hole formed first, then the galaxy of stars could have then formed out of the gas that was swirling around it. What everyone really wants to know though, is what happens when a star gets swallowed by a black hole? Well, a couple of years ago, a gas cloud called G2 came perilously close to the event horizon of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. This is the first time really in human history that we have not only known an event like this was gonna happen, but that we are prepared with the right sort of technology to see the details unfold. Astronomers monitoring the event were able to test the effects of the black hole on this gas cloud. It was essentially on a collision course with one of the most powerful entities in the entire universe, and it was being stretched out on its way there. It was moving quite fast, and it's not moving in a straight line, but it's a curved line. And that's a very, very bad sign because it tells you, well, there's something acting on it. It's, it tells you, wow, gravity is pulling on that object. Instead, though, it was spaghettified and it circulated the black hole and then was essentially catapulted back out into space. Lucky escape for the gas cloud. This event confirmed that it is possible to get perilously close to a black hole and still escape. So. There's a black hole at the center of every galaxy and they have the power to dominate everything around them. But they're not just giant hoovers sucking everything up around them. Stars, gas, dust, they're all happy to orbit them with no issues. We're seeing the black hole at the center having a galaxy-wide effect on the surroundings. So if they really do have a galaxy-wide stronghold and the one at the center of the Milky Way has been there since its existence, that means that you, me, and all the stars that we can see have always, and are currently, right now, orbiting a supermassive black hole. The Milky Way could fit into the universe as we know it 10 million, million, million times. So it's big really big and we know that it's expanding at an exponential rate which means that in about a billion years time the universe will be about 10 percent bigger so do we know how big the universe is right now and could we ever actually map out the size of the universe so let's start with the bits of the universe that we can actually see. Light has a speed limit, so there's only so much of the universe that we can actually see, and we call it the observable universe. We think there are around about 170 billion galaxies in the entire observable universe. What we really need to work out how big the universe is, is a 3D map of it. That's what the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is trying to do. With three coordinates, you can make a 3D image of where to find all of the galaxies in the universe. By placing the plate with the galaxy coordinates over the telescope, they could isolate each galaxy individually and work out a third coordinate for each one. That third coordinate was redshift. With redshift, the team could get the distance to each galaxy from the Milky Way. Dr. Slagle called it a 3D movie on a colossal scale. His team essentially brought the stuff of science fiction to life. Using this new map, cosmologists were able to see how galaxies were arranged in space. Maybe you've seen things like this in the opening of Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever, and, and that all looks great, but it's not real. This movie, it is the real universe. Just like our galaxy, the universe is held together by gravity, but there weren't enough galaxies to generate enough gravity to actually hold the universe together. Most of the stuff in the universe was missing. 
this map led astronomers to some more evidence for something they'd been theorizing for quite a while now. It's simply not enough stuff to arrange things into the patterns that we see have galaxies spinning in the way that they do. There's something else there. There's something beyond the galaxies that we see, the visible matter. It's called dark matter. It's invisible and we haven't found a way of detecting it in a lab yet. I know it can seem like us astronomers just start making up wild theories when we don't understand maybe what's going on, but we do know dark matter is there in the same way that we know the wind is there because we see the trees move. We have so much evidence for it, including the fact that the gravity it generates is literally holding the cosmos together. What we're finding out there in the universe is really weird. It's equivalent to the idea that only one out of six cities in America actually has any people living in it. There is six times more dark matter than there is in all of the stars and the dust in 170 billion galaxies in the entire observable universe. So does that mean that the universe is six times bigger? Well, no, not quite, but the universe is certainly six times heavier than we thought. And it's complicated by the fact that the universe isn't just full of invisible stuff that we can't see, but the stuff that we can see is also moving away from us. The universe is getting bigger, literally, as we sit here watching it. It's an observational fact that if you look at the galaxies around us and the most distant galaxies that we can see, they all appear to be moving away from us. If you were standing in California, you would see New York moving away from you. But from the perspective of New York, you would see Boston move away. By observing the brightness of supernova, Professor Saul Perlmutter and his team proved that the universe is not only expanding, but that its expansion is speeding up at an alarming rate. At the end, we concluded that actually, the universe really isn't slowing down. It's actually speeding up in its expansion. And that was a, a big shock. Professor Perlmutter's discovery was so important to the scientific community that in 2012, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. So after you establish something like that, the question on everybody's minds is why? Well, we don't know, but but we did work out what to call it. We have a name for it, we call it dark energy. We figured out that the universe is about 68% dark energy. The really crucial thing about how this dark energy behaves is that it, it doesn't dilute. When the universe doubles in size, you got twice as much dark energy. Make it four times as big, you've just got four times as much dark energy. So how do you measure something that's big, that's getting bigger, that's full of stuff that we can't see? Well, unsurprisingly, you can't, or at least we can't yet. But what we have done is map out the stuff that we can see. And as usual, the universe has done things that we never expected it to do. And that map revealed that the universe is flat. Cosmologists plotted three points of a very big triangle that went from Earth to two points in space-time as far back as we could go. If the universe were positively curved, if the angles inside the triangle added up to greater than 180 degrees, then it would be finite in size. If the spatial geometry is flat, if the angles inside the triangle add up to 180, then it could go on forever. The answer was mind-blowing. Space itself is flat. Now, we're not talking about the shape of space here. We don't mean space is flat like a piece of paper. We're talking about how light behaves in space. For it to be flat, it means that light would travel on and on in an infinite direction and never be disturbed. If space wasn't flat, that light could loop back on itself. It'd almost be like if you could stare out for long enough and detect light faint enough, then you would be able to see the back of your own head. That means that the simplest picture of the universe is a universe that's infinite. We really could live in a universe where there's galaxy after galaxy after galaxy in every direction, up, down, sideways, and it never stops. This provided the perfect picture of what the universe looks like, an infinite universe filled with galaxies in all directions that is still getting bigger absolutely 
mind boggling. The deep ocean is an alien world. But incredibly, Earth is not the only place in our solar system that has oceans. Oceans that could support life. Wherever we find water, we find life. I want to get data back from a probe and be able to say, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. NASA is planning to launch a mission to explore the methane oceans on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. Yep, you heard that right. Oceans of methane, essentially oceans of liquid farts. They're building a drone to fly over the surface and look for signs of life. Can you imagine the freedom of exploring a planet in that way rather than being stuck on four wheels on the surface? But most excitingly, they're also planning to build a submarine to dive under the surface of these methane oceans in search of life. That first picture, are you kidding? That first picture from a submarine, from anybody's submarine on the surface of, an, of a sea on another planet in our solar system changes the world. I mean, that's, that's something that none of us have ever seen before. That is true discovery. That is why we do any of this. And that would be awesome. That first picture alone would make this entire mission worth it. It was back in 2005 that the Cassini-Huygens probe revealed this surface that really did look quite Earth-like. In fact, it revealed these lakes that had an uncanny resemblance to the Great Lakes of North America. But these aren't lakes of water, they're lakes of methane, and at minus 180 degrees Celsius, they're far too cold for any life form with an Earth-like chemistry. So we're looking for life, but not life as we know it. What I'm really interested in finding is what I call a second genesis of life. Organisms that are clearly not related to any life on Earth. But is it even possible to have life that can survive on methane rather than water? Methane is incredibly flammable. It's even burnt by Hobbes so that we can cook food. To find out, researchers at Cornell University took all of the ingredients that we know are present on Titan and mixed them up. Not in a test tube though, this isn't Breaking Bad, but in a supercomputer. Even without water, they were able to make a cell membrane, essentially the outside wall of a cell, the building block for life. Now I know the dream is to see some great big tentacled monster like rising up from the methane oceans. I mean, realistically, we're looking at something like microbial life, but that still will be incredibly cool because it will be completely different to anything we have on Earth. It will be entirely and 100% alien. We tend to think that life would look like us. You just have to look at the Star Trek movies. All the aliens kind of look like insects and things that we already know. But why not be something completely different? Something that we can't imagine, but something perfectly suited to the, the conditions that, that are on Titan. I grew up when Star Trek was just coming out and it was an inspiration to me. But the key moment was when I realized that the job I wanted was not Kirk's job, but Spock's job. He's the one with the tricorder. He's the one that's detecting life. And my favorite saying is, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. Now, one place we've been looking for life for a long time is the surface of Mars, because although it's barren and dry today, once upon a time, it was covered in an ocean of water. Incredibly, traces of that ocean do still exist today. Four and a half billion years ago, the Martian ocean covered 19% of the planet's surface and was as deep as the Mediterranean. That was until solar radiation bombarded the planet and stripped it of its protective atmosphere, and the water ended up freezing into ice caps on the poles. Mars was a water world. It would have been better to characterize it as a water world, whereas now, of course, it's a desert world. But it's that water world that's interesting. That's the world that may have had life, and that's the world we want to investigate. And crucially, it looked how the Earth looked when life first started on Earth. So if life could have started on Earth, then what's to say that life couldn't have started on Mars? Mars isn't the only place that's getting scientists who are on the hunt for alien life excited. 
The one I'm really rooting to have life on is Enceladus, which is a tiny moon of my favourite planet, Saturn. It shocked us all when we found out that it had water plumes just pouring out of its south pole. It wasn't just spewing out of one crack on the surface, but four huge fissures that were each larger than the Grand Canyon. That amount of water could only mean one thing. Enceladus had to have liquid oceans under its surface. And it's not just Enceladus. High on the list of places that we'd expect to find alien life is Jupiter's moon Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system. Scientists managed to discover that there was an ocean 100 kilometers deep, 10 times deeper than any ocean on Earth, that was encircling the entire moon. Each new ocean discovered gives a little bit of a boost to our chances of finding life elsewhere in the solar system. But could any living thing survive the extreme environment of space and other planets lacking protective atmospheres? Creatures on Earth could give us some idea. Meet this little fella. This is a tardigrade, sometimes known as a water bear or a moss piglet. Moss piglet! <laughs> They're just too cute. These are aquatic, so you'd expect them to die if they weren't in water, but they actually have a very special ability. As that sample drawer starts to dry out, as that specimen starts to dry out, uh, what's cool about these guys is they can survive that extreme desiccation, drying down to like a crispy little booger. Now they might look dead, but as any 90s kid knows, a lot can happen if you just add water. It's not really dead because when we add more water to them, when environmental conditions are good again, they can come right back alive. This ingenious hibernation mechanism makes them one of the most resilient creatures on Earth and means they can survive some really extreme and changeable conditions just like those in space. They have even reanimated after years spent frozen in the intense cold of Antarctica, and they can withstand incredible pressure and even survived being shot out of a gun. It's mind blowing, dude. I guess they're like the hand solo of the microbial world. Like these things could totally survive being frozen in carbonite as well. Took them into space, <laughs> put them on a satellite. Opened up the door, set them outside, exposed them to extreme temperatures, vacuum, right? Hot, cold. Huge radiation. And then when they brought them back to Earth, they did what you're seeing here. Like a machine, man. Yeah. You add the water to it, they take them up, cells start to do their thing again. And they, they come back alive. It, it always blows my, look, I'm an old fat dude and I've looked at these a hundred times. Thousands of times, millions maybe. Man, old. well, <laughs> and then when I actually look at them under the microscope every single time, I'm like, dang, that's cool, yeah, man. Yeah. What's clear after finding all of these other oceans elsewhere in the solar system is that we can't claim to be the only blue planet anymore. But I'm more excited for the day that we can say that we know that we're not the only place in the solar system that has life. Rain made of diamonds and ruby gemstones. 2,500 degree clouds filled with hellish liquid lava and 350 year old giant megastorms. This is the most extreme weather in the universe. Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system and its rings make it instantly recognizable. And personally, it's my favorite planet because it rains diamonds from its clouds. Scientists estimate that around about 10 million tons of diamonds are produced in Saturn's atmosphere every single year. Now the sizes of those diamonds could vary a little bit, but they're estimated to be about a centimeter across. That's the size of a four carat diamond. But why does this happen? We know that on Saturn, there's carbon soot. The carbon soot is created by lightning. Lightning actually zapping methane in the atmosphere. The carbon soot precipitates or falls through the atmosphere. As the carbon soot falls from the clouds, this same crystallization process occurs. But instead of taking billions of years, it happens in a matter of moments. Now, in order for a planet to have weather, it needs an atmosphere, the layer of gas that surrounds a planet. So for example, Earth's atmosphere is made of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and a little bit of water vapor as well. The planet Mercury and our moon, on the other hand, they don't have an atmosphere, hence why they look like gray, lifeless rocks. 
On Earth, a cloud forms where it's too cold for water to stay as a vapour in the air. Now that can happen with other materials too, just at different temperatures. So it's essentially possible to have a cloud made of anything. But what about planets that are so hot that things that exist as solids on Earth are actually liquids and gases in their atmospheres? I'm talking about things like rock and lava. Imagine it being so hot that lava evaporates into the air, forming clouds, and then you get lava raining from the sky. 55 Cancri E is an exoplanet that's about 40 light years away from us. It orbits really close to its star. Not only that, it's also tidally locked, which means that one side of the planet always faces its sun and it's always daytime there and it's boiling hot. The day side is permanently covered in an ocean of molten lava. It can be hard to picture what lava rain would actually look like, but volcanic eruptions here on Earth in places like Hawaii give us a hint of what it might look like. Right here was the site of a massive eruption. All along this fissure, fountains of lava shot into the air nearly 100 meters high. The liquid lava droplets then cooled and solidified in the air before raining down onto the surface as these tiny pebbles. This is what we think the rain might be like on planets like 55 Cancri E. Our planet hunters and astronomers think they have found an exoplanet with the strangest rain in the universe. WASP-12b is an exoplanet 12,000 light years away. It's a gas giant like Jupiter, but it's twice as big and its atmosphere is 2,000 degrees hot. An atmosphere like that, we think the conditions would be just right to give us molten ruby rain. And the way that it scatters light suggests that there are clouds high up in the atmosphere. At this part of the atmosphere, the temperature is around 2,000 degrees. So the most likely substance forming these clouds is an aluminium oxide called corundum, which forms the basis of rubies. This crazy extraterrestrial weather doesn't stop at gemstone rain. There are planets out there that have the most gigantic storms that humankind has ever witnessed. We have Mars rover footage that shows us dust devils that are over a kilometer high. But impressively, the storms on Mars can reach up to 20 kilometers in altitude. And it's all down to Mars's atmosphere. Its atmosphere is 1 100th the pressure of Earth's, and the effect of having that uh, really low atmospheric pressure on Mars means that uh, it can't trap any of its heat. So Mars is a cold, barren desert compared to Earth or to Venus. The dust storms are so bad on Mars that every few years or so, they engulf the planet for months at a time. That's gonna have a major impact on any future human missions that we send to Mars. These storms on Mars though are minuscule in comparison to what's been observed elsewhere in the solar system. We've sent probes and satellites to all of the gas giants and found some mind blowing weather activity. The Great Red Spot is a storm on Jupiter that is twice the size of the entire Earth. It was first spotted by Giovanni Cassini through a telescope in 1665, which means it's been raging nonstop for at least 350 years. And that makes it the longest living storm that we know of. The outer planets are big balls of gas, and that makes a huge difference in the weather because you don't have continents, you don't have mountains for the winds to rub against, and there's nothing to control the uh, weather the way the continents partly control our weather. Saturn is the planet with the largest and most powerful storm in the solar system, covering 4 billion square kilometers. And we know about it because we've seen satellite images of it growing. On December 5th, 2010, the radio uh, receiver on Cassini started picking up the radio signal of lightning. And on the same day, the camera saw a little storm up in the northern hemisphere of Saturn. Within six months, the storm grew so large that it wrapped around the entire planet and its head caught up with its tail. 
The truth is, life on Earth is a huge anomaly in our solar system, our galaxy, and even maybe across the entire universe. The majority of other planets are a lot less inviting. So the planets that we've found so far aren't particularly nice places to go. They're not somewhere you'll put on your vacation list anytime soon. So while we might not describe weather here on Earth as mild all of the time, astronomically speaking, mild is the most appropriate word. What makes Earth so habitable is this perfect mix of conditions that we have that essentially make it like a Goldilocks planet for life. And that includes our proximity to our star, the sun. Any closer and it would be a hellish inferno and any further away it would be a frozen wasteland. So it could just be a matter of time before we find a planet that's similar to Earth. But what we do know is that warm, cold, wet, dry, windy and mild, all of these conditions work in perfect unison to keep us alive here on Earth. Essentially, we got lucky, so think about that the next time you want to moan about the weather. The Big Bang was not the moment of creation. It was actually this. The cosmic dawn, the moment that the very first star in the universe was formed and started forging the materials that we need to make you, me, and everything around us. This is your origin story. Several million years after the Big Bang, the universe was dark and boring, filled with cold hydrogen atoms floating through space. All of the things we treasure did not exist. The Big Bang created space and time and all of the essential ingredients, but it didn't create anything that was recognizable as our present day universe. Instead, it left us with one of the most boring periods in the universe's history, the cosmic dark ages. If you go back to this time of the dark ages, the universe looked completely different. If we had a human observer translated back in time, uh, we would see a completely dark, boring, featureless universe. An utterly alien place, it would appear to us. It was a universe without any light. There were no stars, no galaxies. Now the transformation of our universe into one that we would recognize didn't start until the first stars were born. The cosmic dawn would have been spectacular. There was this magical, if you like, metaphysical moment. It was the starting point that led to the appearance of life. The moment of first light. Let there be light. The first stars are fundamental to how the universe evolved. New galaxies were forming out of darkness. This age of enlightenment was a very dynamic period of time. What we found is that in the early universe, stars are much more massive, maybe even a hundred times more massive than the sun. That has dramatic consequences because massive stars have a very different life, a much more violent life than the kind of low mass star that the sun is. They would be 20 times hotter shining ultraviolet blue, 10 million times more luminous than the sun. They're gonna live for a very short time, only a few million years. That's, that's really nothing. We often say they're like the rock stars in the universe. They live fast and die young. Stars were appearing and disappearing. It's like fireworks. It's very dynamic. It grew up exponentially. Very quickly, within tens of millions of years, there were plenty of stars filling up the universe. The cosmic dawn is the beginning of complexity in the universe that led to our existence. So stars are essentially giant furnaces, right? They take the simplest element, hydrogen, and they transform it into the heavier elements needed for life. This is why stars are so important. They create the sugar, spice, and all things nice needed to make you, me, and the Powerpuff Girls. For the first time, new elements are being made. They take hydrogen, turn it into helium. Helium gets combined to make carbon, and we go to oxygen and silicon. The rocks that we see have been formed inside a stellar interior and then throw them back out into the universe. The gold and the silver 
in the rings on my finger, they've all been made in a supernova. There's no other place in the universe that you can create elements like that. So it might sound like an internet meme, but it's true. We literally all are made of stardust. We have astrophysicist Margaret Burbage to thank for that. She actually managed to figure out what was going on inside stars. So, so far, so good, right? We've got this epic theory of creation that took billions of years just to get the ingredients for you and me. But how do we actually go about proving that that's what happened? So scientists are on the hunt for eyewitnesses, stars that could have been there at that first moment, that cosmic dawn. Luckily, astronomers on the search for ancient stars know what to look for. We know that they are much bluer than the stars of today. That's because ancient stars are made out of pure hydrogen, so they burn much more efficiently and therefore much hotter, which means they're blue. Think about like the flame on a hob or a Bunsen burner, which burns blue, compared to the flame of a candle or the dying embers of a fire, which burns orangey red. In 2013, Stefan Keller and his team found that needle in a haystack, an ancient star in our own Milky Way galaxy that provides valuable clues about what happened at the cosmic dawn. At first we thought we must have done something wrong here, but we confirmed it the next night, and that's when things really got exciting. It's been around for 13.6 billion years. It's a very pristine star. It formed very early on in the history of the universe. In fact, what we're able to do with this star is, for the first time, say that there was only one star that preceded it. So this is the purest star that we've ever found, making it the oldest star that we know of. But it's still only a second generation star, not a first generation star, the first to form in our universe. We need to find one of those, this is why astronomers are excited for the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope later this year, because it might just have a chance of spotting some of these first stars being born. So there was the Big Bang, and then a uh, hundred million years of nothing, and then there was the big switch, when the universe finally turned on the lights. The cosmic dawn. This finally gives us a scientific answer to one of the biggest questions that humanity has ever asked, one we've been searching for answers to for millennia. Where did all this come from? Well, it turns out that the device you're watching this on, the chair you're sat on, and even you yourself, well, all of the stuff that makes all that comes from stars. We are all curious where we came from. If one opens the first chapter of Genesis in the Bible, the Old Testament, one finds a version of this story, how the universe started and how we humans came to live in it. Some bits of this story are right. There was a beginning in time. Light came into existence from darkness. Life was created. We are now at a special time that allows us to explore this question scientifically. We are able to peer deep into space and see those very early sources of light that tell us how we came into existence. And of course, with modern technology, we are hoping to get the story much more accurate. 